Esther, welcome back to the BFI. Thank you very um, much. Do you want to say something about the film quickly? Well, <laughs> like what? <laughs> okay, we, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that because, I mean... <laughs> we start this? Um, yeah, I think that the way we should start is you, you had... Um, you had a background in filmmaking. Last, uh, last year, we showed uh, the film that was made with Sidney Poitier. Um, we also showed the uh, film you made with Ted Kocheff in uh, 1968, I think. Yeah. Uh, two gentlemen sharing. 69, two gentlemen sharing. So you had a, <laughs> um, a rich background in film. That wasn't your first film, though, was it, no. in 1969? No. <laughs> Well, we did The Touchables before that. I started with that for 20th Century Fox. Robert Freeman, who had done all the Beatles films, I did that with him. But, um, you know, I had uh, small parts in other films like uh, The Sandpiper and Genghis Khan and stuff like oh, that. Oh, yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about that, so. Well, uh, the, my first, uh, first time on a film set was that... Uh, Shepperton Studios, um, and I was uh, having lunch with Terence Young, the director of a film he was making down there at the time. But I was taken to the set of um, Beckett and to see Canter Canterbury Cathedral being built. And I was only a teenager at the time. And Jeff Onsworth, who was a god of photography in the film industry, and he made me look through his viewfinder. I think I was lost from there on. You know that that's what you do to set up a set up a shot. You know, or you frame it in this little tiny little mirror that he had hanging on him, and uh, it, the, all the miracle of it was too much. And when I said the set, I couldn't believe that we were actually building this thing, and then it was going to be torn down and thrown away at the end of it all. So now recently I've been living down in Folkestone and got to visit Canterbury, Canterbury Cathedral. And I just couldn't believe that, gosh, why am I here? It must have something to do with my life. It's the beginning of my life in the film industry. I'd never even been a set before. And here am I in the real cathedral and all these kind of things. All sorts of emotions, you know. I didn't know why I was actually there at all. I kept thinking there must be a reason and everything. Um, so that was the beginning of my interest in the film business. Uh, I got a small part in a film called Genghis Khan. I was like the last person to be casted, and I was taken to Yugoslavia, and it so happened that um, the cameraman was Jeff Answorth. So I got sick on that film, and I got to spend a lot of time around the crew, you know, just learning how to make films and watching him and watching the director and uh, all these very big stars we had uh, supporting the other smaller actors because Omar Sharif wasn't known very much in those days. Stephen Boyd was very famous, but um, you know you had these great people like um, James Mason and Robert Morley and people like that supporting roles and Yvonne Mitchell, wow. one of the great people in it. Francois Doliac was Catherine Deneuve's sister. She's not with us anymore either. Tragic accident, and um, yeah, it was Telisa Vellas. Lots of people who just, in a way, watching them and learning from them, you know, what it was like to be professional or you turn up for work and all you had to be devoted and dedicated to do what you want to do. And so that was the beginning of my interest in film. I came home and immediately got started doing TV. I did um, The Avengers and things like that. and. Just went on from there, really. So you were sort of immersed in film culture from a young yeah. age. I went to drama school, but I was always interested in the other side of the camera after my brother actually um, showed me a sort of lantern slide with uh, the glass. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and make a sheet and make a lantern slide for me down there in the bushes that we came from in, in Jamaica. You know, I come from a village that had no electricity or anything, so my brother created all that and uh, let me think what lots of things are possible. So I was always very interested in the camera and the other side of the camera, although as a young girl I was I put in this beauty queen business and I became a Miss Jamaica, so a beauty queen underage, not supposed to be in the contest, whatever. But I made enough money to get out of Jamaica and came to England and 
studied acting, studied drama, and also helped to launch Island Records over here, uh, the first, the British side of Island Records with Chris Blackwell. So I was like doing two jobs at the same time, you know, doing helping to run Island Records, but also going to drama school and studying all the time, DJing at nights. I'm like the first female DJ in here. <laughs> Lots of people don't know that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I could say, I take all the credit for introducing Stevie Wonder to this country. <laughs> With fingertips, you remember fingertips? That's one of his great beginnings. He was all 15 when he did that, or 14. Yeah, we had, and then we brought over people like Million. Oh, yeah, yes. Jimmy Cliff and people like that. But, um, yeah, so I oh, just went on from there and... Um, then got my first part in the Genghis Khan film after you know, Island Records had taken off by then and Millie had done very well, the record was on the world. I used to travel the world with her, but went to Africa everywhere with her. But once she took off and was like, the song went up to number one all around the world. In England it was number two, but it never stopped. And um, well, that is the thing. Um, the creative work just developed more and more and more. I got interested in photography and filmmaking, and I trained with um, a girl who used to photograph me. She started teaching me how to use the camera and how to um, develop films and understand how to mix the chemicals and how to use a light meter, all the things that we don't have to do anymore because everything's so easy for these younger people now. Yeah, yeah. But, but that, so that's where you're background is to the footage that you shot. Well, the, footage, the footage shot on a video camera, and I'd never use a video camera, although I do have a 35 Ariflex okay. that shoots film, not video. So video just come in. It wasn't That's part of my video. Thing. You know, we thought, you can't light it, and we were very snobby about it because, you know, with film, it's oil, and you know how to light it, and you can get beautiful images, and everything was flat on video, and you didn't like it. Anyway, and I wasn't really interested in, in it at all, but, you know, Dickie says, here it is, use it and, uh, you know, and catch what you can with them and let's do this blueprint and see if we can make this documentary. And that's Dickie Jobson yes. who made the film yes. Countryman. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, thank God he actually did that. <laughs> and that, so that, that footage in the film, that's a fragment, really, isn't it, of, of the footage you shot? That's uh, a, a fraction of, of the footage you originally shot? Yes, yes. Most of, I haven't gotten all, all the footage we shot, absolutely not, but at least we got enough that we could fashion a little movie for you to see. And I'm very, very, very sorry to everybody here that you did not get to see the print that has got subtitle. Terrible, just a I don't terrible know what thing. What happened? John Marcus' fault. It, listen, it was. <laughs> I take full Nothing responsibility <laughs> for the copy, Somebody but with a great advantage that you can get the DVD afterwards that has the, uh, the subtitles. <laughs> has it got subtitles on it? Of course. I doubt it. Esther, when, Esther, when, when, uh, when, when you um, came in, you spotted the uh, sachet ray poster. Oh, yeah. And you mentioned Sachit Ray and Kurosawa. Very and much Kurosawa. a great, great Those two directors, filmmakers, are a great influence on me as a young filmmaker because we were just always into, into, you know, interested in independent cinema and um, and I like it that there were people that uh, were different <laughs> like me and so I identified with them. I yeah. said, ah, so he's making real films. It's not just Hollywood, Bollywood jumping up and down and dancing. This man makes real films about real people. So I really loved his work. We didn't see, in those days, they used to have classic cinemas all over London, in Oxford Street, all over. In Chelsea, I think we had two classic cinemas. And so you'd be able to see all these foreign movies and um, a lot of French films and films from Scandinavia and Italy. All these films very, very had a, you know, Truffaut and Godard, all those people are a big influence on us. Not Hollywood films was getting, because in those days, Hollywood films really, they were coming to England and co-producing with using European actors in all their Hollywood movies. 
they always had, you know, some English and some Parisians and some Italians in their movies. But then it just, after a while, it just became a lockdown takeover and totally we own the screens now in Europe and you just take our films and that's it. And that's Esther, it. I should, and I should mention this to you, uh, I first uh, <laughs> uh, met John and Esther um, when they had made a film called The Three Duma. And um, like um, well, the that, film yeah. you've just seen, these were films that they wanted to make. Mm. They weren't big commercial funded projects, mm. but they were a labor of love to create something it was authentic and yeah. not uh, tell a story that hadn't been told before. That is it. I wanted to, um, I started on an idea of a trilogy with researching about Alexander Pushkin. I came about uh, across Duma. And I said, oh, my God, and so he's got black. He's also African descent, and he's African descent. And I decided that I was going to make a series of films, and first it was a trilogy, would be three men of uh, important um, contribution to popular culture that is of African descent. And so I started with working on the Pushkin, but then all of a sudden they we were in Paris, and they decided to do Duma. They were going to excavate and take him out of his grave <laughs> and God knows what else and put him in the Pantheon. So that is it. I sent him off down there with the camera. He was the first one on the spot to actually see the, uh, the old bones of Duma coming out after 300 years out of the grave. And in fact, we saw that footage, didn't we, to American Pictures or AIP or something and uh, help us to buy footage that we could continue to film. But um, yeah, Alexander Dumas took part, took, became number one instead of Pushkin. And then we did the Mali after that. And uh, now I have Pushkin um, in work in progress on that. But uh, it's a big one, that one. I can't mess it up at all. And I don't have a budget. All these films that I've made basically is what you call guerrilla filmmaking for independent filmmakers, how to take, I learned this from Agnes Bard, who was a French woman filmmaker and a great friend. She's not with us anymore, but she, her body of work is huge, uh, making independent films. And she showed me how you could use the digital camera to actually make a movie. And because all the time I have my 35 Ari and you know, so, you know, it's all 35 Ari flex and I just can't think in that way. And then immediately I see what Agnes had done with the gleaners it's a great film. Mm. And I just thought, wow. And I talked to Jean about it. And uh, well, we decided, why not? Let's just get digital cameras and start working with them. And that's when we went in search of Duma. We have a whole film in search of Duma, which isn't been shown to you. Right? For you to see all how people reacted to this film all over the world. This film has been going since 2011. Okay. This is the third time it's shown here. Yeah. Sold out first and second time. And even the work in progress is so very successful. And apparently, because we won a UNESCO Honors Award, reggae music was then taken and made a national heritage to be protected by UNESCO, by United Nations. And, uh, you know, it's a big one. It's a big one for us, yeah. And also that the second album that we did, which is produced at Cheney Row and the photographs that then end up again on the first album, second and th first and second album. That album is now in a capsule in the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, and that um, capsule has got other things from the last century, and they'll open it in the year 3000. And you know we'll be gone, but the work continues, and uh, and they say that when that capsule is open, they'll say. Bob Marley was a true prophet, and the man from Time magazine had written up about it, and it was sent, all the information was sent to me about that this had happened to the Burning Album. And of course, because also the Burning Album show you the Rastafarian people for the first time, you know, where the music came from, how they suffered, you know, everything, and how to them came the songs and everything. That is on, on that album, you know, Burning and Looting is definitely part of their life, you see, what happened to them. We push for time, so I'm gonna, Let's hand over to John quickly and just talk about how the two of you work as filmmakers. Well, I think that, you know, it works, um, uh, I think it works rather well. Uh, I really like it. I think that um, e e Esther has um, uh, courage to break the rules. 
and to just be creative. Um, and and that, that makes it very easy to actually just do something and don't hesitate to just go and do it and come back and try to fix it. Um, and, um, and that makes a whole, a whole difference. I think that the, 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 the most interesting thing is that, you know, the creative energy as an artist, I see myself as a, as a painter. So I am very comfortable with the idea of just, you know, having a, a brush and just touching up and then do something with it, you know. And that's something you can do as a guerrilla filmmaker that you can't do as a commercial. <laughs> Well, it's 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 unless it's, you're very I've fortunate. Been there for you have somebody on top of you saying, oh, you know, the money and the bank and you know how you how you, you finish and it's done time and when am I going to get it? Once you're in charge of your own production and you have your own company and stuff, you you're working at your own time and your own pace, so you don't really have to give yourself a heart attack or blood, well, high blood pressure. Yeah, I think that I think that <laughs> the 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 industry has provided a great heritage for everyone. I mean, we see it, you know, in even even this or the bottle, you know, it's industrial products. There's very little things in this room that might not be industrial. So it could be countered by, you know. Um, the, they have a heritage. They have something to to contribute. I think that you know we we might we find ourselves halfway. I think that we we were able to take care of the post production ourselves. We didn't have to delegate to Soho or to Universal Pictures to do that. Uh, we've got subtitles in you know about six languages that we have done ourselves, well, and we were able to provide the the material to the aggregators and to film it. Yes, you're absolutely right, because in Jamaica, uh, that is exactly how it is, too, anyway. He said in, in, in part of the conversation, Peter said, imagine just two men who own the earth. Where he's talking about is two men that own the earth, right? The earth is just Jamaica. He means the two opposition, the, uh, he said something about the opposition and the leader, is the PNP and the JLP, the two parties that run the island since we were little children. So to him, they think they own the world, they own the earth. Because he used to say to me, if I didn't think that I own the own earth, I would do something terrible, like, you know. Um, and so he said, my father owned everything, so I own everything. And he used to say those things to me to, in his mind that he don't have to feel any resentment about the way they um, do his people and uh, do the people in. But, you know, he didn't voice it as much as Peter Tosh did. Peter was not afraid to speak out about the, the people who the way they were repressed and done in. And, um, well, that's how it was anyway. Well, the soon come business. <laughs> we know it because you know Chris Blackwell was our uh, is the head of the record company. So in fact, all that soon come business came really from him. And Peter wrote a, a song about it um, because when he doesn't want to, to do you and deal with you immediately, he's always soon come, soon come, soon come, and you never see him for like months and months. You know, he's soon come business. So that is um, part of the. Uh, the kind of thing that they all throw away. And especially, it only happens actually, I think that the women get it a lot from their partners. <laughs> but when it comes to business, you still have the people like Chris Black will tell you to soon come. And you can't see him to actually work out anything about your business or what you need uh, to be able to do the work. Right. Well, because I was, um, you know, I was very certain of myself. I, I had just finished starring a multi-million dollar movie with an Oscar winning stars in the budget. There's no way any Jamaican is going to tell me nothing, even if he was the prime minister of Jamaica. You understand? So that is it. You see, I get here, I just said, why? So this is what we want to do. And this is what, and I went to the, the poorest people. I filmed and photographed the poorest people because those are people I want to represent. I was the one that chose this idea that I'm going to push the reggae thing into the music to actually show about these people who are being disenfranchised and put on this, uh, the French society, kept off as if to say they don't belong. They're not a part of, uh, of the 400 years of suffering that everybody had gone through. So. It was no big thing for me to actually go straight in there, go to Bongo Maki, and I come from St. Mary, you know, 
Oh, is them come from? Before you know it, and the same thing with Countryman. Countryman came from Anatomy originally. So I had a lot in common with them. Very easy for me to go straight to the real people and get out of them and tell them what I want to do. And everybody was there ready to help, you see. That's the way it was. Um, you know, the only person I ever had any problem with was Bonnie Whalers. And uh, it, it's just because that's the way his personality was. He just... Uh, and Esther, we, we've, almost, we've almost got to wind up. Yeah. But I, I'm going to jump in and just ask the last question, which was about the soundtrack. Oh, the soundtrack. The, the I soundtrack couldn't get to use um, any of the songs. Got Chris Blackwell put... Um, a lot of uh, lawyers on me to stop me and uh, John. We had the, we, our film was taken to America. We were um, premiered at, at, in New York City at uh, Robert De Niro's cinema, where we were given letters from lawyers telling us we can't show. It. Chris Blackwell said that we're using his things and blah blah blah. We're not allowed. And basically, it was the songs that we had collaborated with with Bob and I had, which we, we wanted to share with you, the public about the work we did and where it came from, all these songs, you know, and, and tell you a little bit more story. But we were not allowed to do that. So basically we had to just find new music in that, in one night. In one night, Family Man's Son, my brother in Canada. We just had lots of musicians sending their work and that's how we created the soundtrack in less than 24 hours. We were able to show the film. The two of your songs. Yeah, and, yeah one of my songs. One of my songs is on it, yeah. And so we did it, and, and because the prime minister's wife from Jamaica had been flown up, lots of official people, people were paying like $240 a, a ticket to come to, to the screening, a huge thing put on in New York City to raise money for a charity in Jamaica by Joe Higgs' um, niece. Um, she ran it, she was a lawyer, and she brought us there to America and the film and the whole thing to help this charity, which is... A, bright children in Jamaica who are really poor, but they had, they had the possibility to go further. So we said then the screening for this is all the money is going to this charity. And Chris Blackwell tried to stop it. And Nikiki Vogel. Nikki, Nikiki Vogel is the name of the girl, and she was the granddaughter of granddaughter. Yeah, and the niece of Paul Vogel. Paul Vogel and, and Joe Higgs, the man who trained the, the whalers. So it's a fantastic team of people. All the, the the daughters and sisters all came up to New York for them, and then Chris tried to crash the whole thing, but we won in the end because the, his lawyer then sent us back. I think said, "Good luck with your Bob Marley film," and John Marcus immediately went and um, we call it registered Bob Marley film as ours. <laughs> they they can't use it. <laughs> Uh, you know, my partner Chris Blackwell helped to build Island Records when I was a uh, shareholder. You know, he just is unbelievable. Anyway, we have business we have, is different. We're <laughs> lucky to have Esther with us for, for some time after we leave here. Unfortunately, we're running a really tight ship. We move cinema, so we've got to make way uh, for the next screening. But just before we give Esther a big hand, I think um, we have a gift for Esther. Oh, how very sweet. Oh, how lovely. Thank you.